Okay, thanks. John, we're recording now. Thank you. This is Rick Clemente with a star again plug. And uh, we were just talking about finding your birth time. If you're one of the lucky people, Pennsylvania has phenomenal records. They just have really good records going back to the 30s. Of course, when children were born at home with midwives, the records get a little shakier. But if you're one of the lucky ones, we just simply go through the Department of Vital Records. Um, in Newcastle, it does cost $20 to get a new birth certificate, and you must state right on there, I want my birth time. I don't know why these people have your birth time, and they won't tell you unless you ask for it. I don't know what it is, but I, I feel sorry for other states. They're just not as good. Anyhow, tonight there's a lot to talk about. As you know, I've been writing a lot recently about um, Eris and the birth of the Divine Feminine. For those of you, some side notes, who are having trouble with your microphones, uh, we have published five steps to take in your chat box. The chat box will tell you uh, how to alleviate microphone problems. Also, if you want to know more about Eris, John, make sure you republish what I, I wrote a link on Eris today to an article by a British group that did a wonderful job of explaining about Eris. Eris now is sitting about 23 of Aries. It's been in Aries all our lives because she takes about 560 years to go around a circle. So she'll be in Eris all of our lives. I was born with Jupiter and Eris together in the same degree. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Eris. There's a lot to learn. I'm not going to go into it too much, but you heard the origins of it when you heard Sally Patton on here. Um, our first guest on the subject of the Divine Feminine. You will have other authors come on here, at least two more, talking about the Divine Feminine. And I'm finally convinced and I'm glad they taught me that the reason the Divine Feminine is launching now is clearly because of the conjunction with Uranus in Aries. And even though Aries is not a real feminine energy, it's getting it launched. So Uranus is in Aries, and it will be a different flavor when Uranus goes into Taurus, when Uranus gets into Cancer, etc. I'm sorry, when Aries does. Aries is a strange fella. She is a, a um, dwarf planet out beyond Pluto. Actually, sometimes her orbit, her egg oval-shaped orbit is sometimes closer to the sun than Pluto is, but rarely. But we'll talk much more about her as she reveals herself to us. She was discovered in 2003, and that's a big deal. She is the goddess of discord, and she uh, was left out of a party. There was a big invitation to parties amongst the gods and mythology, and she was left out, and her mythology follows from there. That article that we're printing down there in the chat box will explain her nature very well. The article is extremely good. Um, so we're finding that the discord is really because of Eris, and I don't know about you, but I found this recent Mercury retrograde to be the absolute worst one I've ever seen. And that was because Eris was close to Uranus. Uranus was opposite Jupiter, all while Mercury was retrograde. But anyhow, you may feel differently, but I got a lot of inspecting to do. Um, as with always, when you come on here, please self-mute. Mute your audio. Hi, Lav. Good to have you. Um, Mute your audio because we get feedback and we get all kinds of screw ups. And then later on, if you wish to talk, unmute yourself. Now, tonight we're going to talk about all this airy stuff. I'm going to show you charts of that. I'm going to save a lot of time so I can talk about our feature chart, which is Louise. And I'm going to change that now to this 
little privacy. And because this will end up on YouTube. This is Astrology Unplugged. This is the topic. This is the show where we talk a lot about astrology. It's a fireside chat without the fire. And in February, maybe we're going to need to get that fire going. Um, I've taught so many classes, I'm pretty much retired from it. I have decided to teach one more class in case you're interested. One more beginning class if you are interested. Write to me at rick at starself.com. Rick at starself.com if you're interested. I am forming a class with um, a minimum of eight people. It'll be an eight week course. Okay, so tonight. We're going to talk about all these planets in Aries. And if you read my new recent newsletter, I pinpointed the time, volatile times of February 20 and 21. I'm going to show you why. And I believe I showed you February 28th, but the real critical days here are February 2021 and March the 30th. I want to show you why. So let's start out with February 20th. So I'm going to animate this chart and move forward to February 20th. Do you guys see the chart? Do you see uh, the North Node over here looking like a horseshoe? Okay. I love having Karen there. Karen does a good job with this and with that. So that's good. <laughs> okay, I want you to notice something. You've got a new planet added here. This is not a planet. This is Eris. This is her symbol. She looked like a clock hand that's hanging down, like a clock that doesn't work. She looks like Mars pointing downward instead of upward. But that's her symbol. I don't care for it but there are reasons that these glyphs are chosen. Here's Uranus in Aries, here's Eris in Aries, here's Mars in Aries, here's Venus in Aries. Tremendous amount of Aries. At the same time, we've still got three planets in Pisces. At the same time, we've got the opposition to Jupiter and the T-square to Pluto. So there's a lot happening, but I'm mainly going to be talking about um, let me get my uh, let me get my notes here. I'm mainly going to be talking about this, okay? All right, all right. Now this is February twenty, and the reason that this is significant in February twenty one is not a What's that? Uh, we only see February 9th chart. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Let me let me go ahead and let me go ahead and move. Do you see Feb 20 now? See okay. Okay, there you go. There's somebody wrapped up like a bunny over in Ocean City, trying to keep warm. Okay, what's significant about this is not the fact that these four planets are in Aries. That's very significant, but because of this. I'm getting used to my new tools. All right, we want to draw with a uh, line. Mars to Pluto. There's the significance. Do you see the line I drew? All right. Pluto has been going from zero, zero to 18. It's going to go from zero to 30 between 2008 and 2023. It's now sitting around 18 degrees of Capricorn. And when it sits there, it's kind of like <clears throat> you've all played around when you were little kids and you played king of the mountain. Well, you've all been unfortunate enough to be at the bottom of the mountain 
and the whole crew, the whole group is sitting on top of you, you know, and they're tickling you, and you're going through this era of this big guy sitting on you. Well, what that's like is after a while, you kind of get used to it. But when Mars comes along, like it's going on February 20 and 21, it's like somebody else jumps on the pile on top of it. So it's not really what the Mars is doing, it's the combination of what Mars is doing in addition to what Pluto is doing. This is extremely dangerous. The Pluto is under pressure, why? Because of the Jupiter 22, the Uranus at 21, 22, 21, T squared to Pluto at 18. That dynamic triangle is always there. It's always in the background. And it shows you how a lot of our astrologers are not doing their job. They're busy keeping your mind filled with full moons and new moons and lunations and blue moons. They can't tell you what it means. They tell you to go away to fire and wish for what you want to. Well, that's not really astrology. What's really astrology is not what Venus is doing going retrograde. It's what the big planets are doing. And right now, the Jupiter Uranus is causing all of the social unrest, all the social uprising, and it's all the devotion. Now we're finding ourselves through social media. This great big tension all going to Pluto. Jupiter, Uranus, Pluto. This is the dynamic you're seeing now. The women's rights speaking up to the president. The social media speaking up to the president. This dynamic that's going back and forth. Well, now when Mars gets involved in Aries approaching Uranus, and it's going to square Pluto from one degree away. That's when Mars hits, when it's one degree away like clockwork. So here you see 17... 1737 is just about one degree shy of Pluto at 1834. So around the 20th, you're going to see Mars, someone's going to attack. Now that attack can be verbal. That attack can be political. It can be from other countries. And since the Pluto is in Capricorn, we're going to analyze the Pluto now. And whenever you want to analyze anything, you put it on the first house, which is always over here. So, since the Pluto's here in Capricorn and, and Mars is coming from Aries, which is the bottom, that means it's coming from home. Home, career. Home, the public. Self, others, home, public. That's the four basis of astrology. So what that means, he's going to be attacked from home. Why am I saying he? Because 45 is definitely the manifestation of the plutocracy. 45 has a name. His name is everywhere on every article and every picture for the last two years. And if you need to know his name, go look up president number 45 because I'm not stating. Okay? Now, Mars is attacking. Why does Mars attack? Mars attacks if the body that it's hitting is not acting. Mars doesn't care about fairness. Mars cares about getting things done, especially aggressive things. Mars, he's going to be pushed by people to start wars. He's going to be pushed to attack, show off his new tanks, show off his new jets, drop some new drones. But he's also being pushed by people with the Jupiter Uranus, people that are talking on Facebook, people that are talking all across the web, all the women that are organizing. He's also being pushed to do things that are more holistic for the country. So you're going to see this stuff really get peaked on the 20th and 21st. Also, all these rumors, innuendo, whatever you want to call it, about the ties to Russia, they're going to come about too during this time. This is a very dangerous time. There's this very possible 
during this time that war will start or warlike efforts will be made. I'm not saying there will be a war, but I'm telling you that the likelihood goes way up when Mars gets involved because when Mars is involved, you feel like punching. You feel like asserting. So this is why the 20th and 21st of March, and we're talking what, 10 days from now, is a volatile time. Now in your chart, I saw an article today by a woman, maybe you saw a posting I did about a piece I cut from Alan Oaken. I was reading Alan Oaken's feed, and he's a wonderful esoteric astrologer out of Bali. Really one of the best in the world, one of the best writers. He's not really Western, he's more esoteric, which is a, a different science. But he was talking about a dialogue about what the planets are doing. And typically a non-astrologer asks him the question, well, what's going to happen to me? Could you take a moment and look at my chart and see what's going to happen to me? Because I can't take much more. First of all, he said to her, listen, I cannot tell you what's going to happen to you unless I do a thorough analysis of your chart. He said, I'm not trying to hustle you, but I need to see your whole chart. Can you imagine a doctor trying to tell you on the phone because you got sniffles, he's trying to tell you on the phone what's wrong with you without examining you? That's what people are asking. Now, we certainly have compassion for the lady who's asking for relief. She's asking for what's going to happen. But I thought it was a real good answer because he showed you how I've got to see your whole chart. Secondly, I want to point out something to you, and this is very important. And you need to hear this, and we need to say this another five billion times, because I've already said it one billion, and it needs to be said over and over until people get it. The planets are not out here to get you. A lot of articles will lead you towards this thought that the planets are going to be bad, things are going to get worse. You see my article, so many times I write very carefully, you will be energized. Oh, it's going to be awful. It's going to be stimulated. Oh, it's going to be terrible. I didn't say that. But people take that reaction. And that's because we've got a, we frankly have a self viewpoint that we're so small, we're so helpless. No, I need to introduce him. Energies are energies. Please mute your microphones, please. Okay. Thank you. And then when you come on, unmute yourself. So when most, there are times in astrology, I will admit to experience, there are times, rare, that some plants are going to kick your butt pretty good. That's going to happen. Most of the time, it's just life energies and an extra wave comes along and that can affect your boat and it can give ripples in your lake, but it doesn't mean you're gonna get tipped over. So stop with the thinking that the planets are coming by and just because you're aware of it, you're gonna sink. It's very common with new astrologers that planets come by and you think, oh my, look what's gonna happen. Most of the time, what it means is somebody's taking your plug out of 110, they plugged it in another place, maybe 220 or some other variation of voltage. It's just different energies. And how are you going to deal with it? Most people that can't deal with energies, think, of, think about the people you know. Most people that complain or worry about what energies are going to do to them, think about it. These are people that have a hard time no matter which way the wind's blowing. They just do. I'm sorry, but think about it. So we got to get the boogeyman perception out of astrology. The next date I want to go to is very important. I want to go to March, March the 30th. And this is really, really critical. And I'll show you why. Okay, let's go by months. 
I want to go by days, and I want to go by March the 30th. All right. Let me show you why that is. I realize it stopped. Somebody needs to mute. So I'm going to put in number 45. You need something else? Somebody needs to mute your microphone, please. Okay, Trump's chart. All right. I'm getting to the point here. Okay. Three thirty seventeen. Okay. Do you see this chart, everybody? You don't see it? Okay, let me try to come back. Okay, do you see an inner wheel and an outer wheel? Louise? All right. This is the 10th harmonic chart of 45. Okay, now a harmonic chart is a derivative from a natal chart. I use the 10th harmonic now and then because it shows me, since it's number 10, it is Capricorn-like. It is a derivative from the birth chart. This shows you trumps on the inner circle. This inner circle never changes. This is symbolic of Mr. Trump's social standing, 10. 10 is Capricorn. Your place in the sun, your job in the world, certainly the presidency. And on October, on March the 30th, you see up here, March the 30th, that's the outer wheel. That's where the planets are going to be on March the 30th, okay? The inner wheel is his 10th harmonic. And on March the 30th, Pluto uh, Pluto is going to be opposite the sun. Exactly. Now, on March the 30th, you see Pluto opposite the sun. Pluto is not one of those planets that hits exactly like Uranus does. Uranus always hits exactly. Mars always hits one degree away. Pluto will most likely, when it's exact, stir up a lot, but when another planet gets involved, like Mars or the Sun, then whoopee! This is symbolic of his presidency is under, under tremendous problems now. He's going to face tremendous pressure from other countries over Plutonian issues. Atomic weapons, Abuse of power, abuse of the economy, being heavy handed. These are Pluto issues. Why is it other countries? Because it's an opposition. Here's the sun, here's Pluto in opposition. March 30th, when that sets up, even if you're doing really good and you're treating other countries great, you're still going to have some pressure from it. But when you've got a history, of abusing your power. That's what Pluto does. Pluto stops you when you're abusing your power and it removes your weapons. Now, and remember, this is the seventh house. It's coming from opposition. This is the house of known enemies. 
known enemies. These are your Koreas and your Iran and your Iraq. These people are gonna raise against you. They may even launch some kind of missiles for whatever reason. I'm not saying there's gonna be a war, but I'm telling you, this is very dangerous and they're gonna go after it. They already don't like it, okay? So these are the two time periods you have to look for. February 20 and 21, March 30. And notice that March 30, 10 degrees before, 10 days before, the sun goes into Aries. So what's going on with all these planets in Aries? I'll tell you, and I told you in my recent newsletter, Back before May 27th in 2010, 2010, May 27th, for years and years and years, I noticed people were not very sure of themselves, especially non-Aries, because Aries people are usually very sure of themselves. Well, all of a sudden, we got the March 27th of 2010, and Uranus, finished 84 years in one zodiac and on that day it shifted into zero aries and it sends its energy through the entire zodiac like a shock wave that's how uranus works but i noticed people all around me were coming to me sure of themselves they weren't asking questions they weren't asking hey i'm going to move is this a good idea hey i'm going to start a new job is this a good idea Hey, I'm going to do this. Is this a good idea? Because people are basically pretty unsure of themselves, unless you're an Aries. All of a sudden, I noticed everybody was just saying, Hey, Rick, this is what I'm going to do. Good, go do it. Hey, this is what I'm going to do. So, what happened during those times? Remember, we all have all 12 signs inside of us, but sometimes we can't get to each one very well because we're so tied up with our drama of our sun sign. Well, that's what this Aries period is doing. It's doing it to me. I can feel it. It's doing it to the women's movement. It's going to do it everywhere. You're going to start feeling sure of yourself. You're going to start feeling dynamic. You're going to start feeling like you want to get something started. And that's very good. The bad side is, you got to watch Mars because Mars is very blindly, it's blindly selfish. I want what I want and I want it now. And I'll take a club with me. No, that's not how you deal with Mars. You feel like it, but don't do it. So this is why you're seeing activation happening now. How many of you are feeling rather Martian since Mars rules Aries? How many of you feel kind of Aries like, well, you're feeling like, I'm getting off my butt and I'm going to go do something. And I'm sure they're all quite different. Very good. It's good to see your hands. You are being okayed. You are being, being, getting my checklist. It is real. It is true. Now the other side, watch yourself. Don't go out and just start chastising people. Don't go out putting people down. Assert yourself, but do so in a tactful way. And the problem with Mars is always separating aggression from assertion. Separating aggression from assertion. Yes, assert yourself, and you can do so very effectively. But really watch out if you're going to choose aggression, because you're just going to draw to yourself. That's why a lot of these actions that uh, the new government is taking is just making more terrorists. Because we're saying, hey, you whole group of people, we don't like you. You're not welcome here. Well, they're going to get offended. That's not the most tactful way to deal with it. Yes, I want to see terrorism stop, but that's not how you deal with it. You need a saner approach. Okay, before I move on, do you have any questions about this Aries time period? What's going on? How you're feeling it in your chart? And in my newsletter recently, I talked about each sun sign. If you're not getting my newsletter, go to my website, starself.com, and sign up on the newsletter, and you'll start getting everyone 
every week. And on the bottom left, bottom left of my newsletter, it says Rick's latest. Thank you, Karen. Um, you'll see Rick's latest newsletter and you can read my latest one, which is all about this big area and time we're in now. So you can get access that way. I also brought free broadcast all my newsletters on um, YouTube like tonight and on Facebook. So does anybody have questions? Because in that newsletter, I went by Sun Sign and I explained basically how this Aries push is going to affect each of you. Anybody have questions before I move on? Yeah, uh, Patricia, you're on. Yeah, my, my sun sign is Taurus. Right. But my Mercury is 17 Aries. Right. My Venus is 10 Aries. My Saturn is 23 Aries with Uranus okay. and Eris sitting on it. Okay. And can I have my Pluto's 29 Cancer? Okay. Oh, my so basically. My Basically, what's happening to you, and here's how we do sun sign astrology. We put yeah. Taurus, we put Taurus in the twelfth house. I'm sorry. We put Taurus in the first house. Anything uh -huh. you're going to examine, you put it in the first house. On a clock that's between eight o'clock and nine o'clock. For you Tauruses and for all Tauruses, the Uranus, the Aryan, the Aryan exacerbation is happening in your twelfth house. The 12th house is hard to talk about. So what yeah. it's going to do, the 12th house is the hidden, dreamlike, godlike part of yourself. It's the unconscious mind. And this is not easy for Taurus. But what's going to happen with you, Patricia, is your unconscious mind is going to keep surfacing things. Things are going to keep coming to the surface for solution. Things that were repressed down in the subconscious are going to keep wanting to come up for processing, okay. okay? So that's what you have to look for. Anybody else have questions about um, what these Aries planets are doing? Anybody? Okay, I'm, go I'm going to move on. Okay, good. Now, my natal Mars is opposite Aries in Libra. I just don't have time to read all these. My natal Mars is opposite Aries in Libra. How are those all, all those Aries planets? How are all those Aries planets? Well, it's very simple, Yvonne. You're not only, let me see if I can find you here. There you are. You're on the air now, Yvonne. Um, not only are you having your Libra, what is your sun sign? Gemini. Okay. If you're a Gemini, first of all, we're not going to talk about the other stuff. If you're a Gemini and you put Gemini in the first house, then Uranus is coming from Aries, which is your 11th house. My ascendant's Taurus. I'm not doing it by the regular houses. Okay. I'm doing it by whole sign, putting full Gemini in the full first house. That's how you do predictions for the masses. So for all Gemini, Uranus is activating your 11th house. And the 11th house means get up and go and go after your dreams. What are you doing? Why aren't your dreams manifesting? Because you're not getting up and doing anything. That's what Mars is saying to you. You want this? Go do it. Well, what happens with Gemini? Well, they want this and they want that and they want this, but, but they want this, but they want that. But Aries doesn't want to hear that anymore. That's exactly what's happening to you. If you want to go for the gusto, for the things that are important in your life, because the 11th house is hopes and wishes in a big way, then you're starting to see the reason you have not manifested your 11th house is because you haven't taken enough dramatic action. Does that make sense to you? Well, um... Part of it does. I I have really been working my butt off, it's taking not a action. It's not a matter of it's not. I've been having trouble Yvonne, making up my mind Yvonne, between. Yvonne, 
It's not a matter whether you've been working your butt off. What matters is are you working towards your goals and your dreams? Yeah, but I'm having trouble d deciding back and forth between two or three things. Uh-huh. So you got going down the road and one road, one, one wheel wants to go left and one wheel wants to go right and one wheel wants to go left and one wheel wants to go right. What do you think is going to happen? And there's another one wants to go down the middle. Right. So what do you think is going to happen? Do you think you're going to get to your destination? Not anytime soon. <laughs> so not ever because you got to get your wheel lined up. So it's very simple. And Geminis can really fool themselves. And you need to realize that going left and going right and going left and going right is a safety mechanism. It's a defense mechanism because you can always fall back and say, I couldn't get there because my wheel kept going like this. So your answer is, if you really want this, if you really have your heart set on a certain type of life, then you need to go for it and get the butts, get the butts out of the discussion. Next, next, next question. Who was that? Thank you. You're welcome. Who is the next question? All right, I'm moving on now. Okay. We're going to now go to Louise's chart. I've been very anxious to do this for many reasons. We're a little bit early, but I'm doing it on purpose. Okay. Now here is, uh, we'll go back. Get rid of this guy. Okay. Here's Louise's chart. Does everybody see Neptune up at the top of the chart? Okay. Oh. Yes and no, I'm getting. Not coming up. I'm uh, getting yeses and nos. Okay. How about now? Do you see Neptune sitting at the top of the chart? Okay. Now, the reason her angles are tilted, here's the ascendant and the descendant. You all see that? Okay, and here's the mid heaven, here's the nadir. Those are actually, where am I at here? Okay, those are actually the point on top of her, the point below her, the point to the east, the point to the west, it's just that she's born in Derby, England. She's born at such a height. Remember, we're at the 40th parallel here in Pittsburgh. She's born at the 53rd almost. So when you're born in northern climes or southern climes, these angles seem to be more crooked. Notice how big the first house is. Notice how huge the seventh house is. Notice how tiny the fifth house is. What that means is, trig trigonometrically, during the time she was born, and the Earth was on such a tilt, it just means that it took the sun the same time to go through the first house and the second house as it did to go through here and here and here. So they're really okay, they're really normal to see things like this. It's just a little shocking to your eyeball when you're, you're not used to seeing things. So what do we see? We see a sun in Sag, we see a moon in Gemini, we see Capricorn rising, Venus is in Scorpio, Mars is in Sag, Jupiter's in Sag, Mercury's in Sag, four planets in Sag, Pluto's in Virgo, Uranus is in Leo, Moon is in Gemini. Okay. So a couple of things stick out right away. I told you that the four angles are the real major parts of the chart. And that includes these areas. This area. This area. This area. and this area. 
Those are your four angular areas. And when planets are in that part, those planets become accentuated. So there's nothing here and there's nothing here, but we see Saturn is extremely strong and we see that Venus Neptune is very strong. Okay, so you have to ask yourself first thing. Let's see. Inner take. Clear. All right. You have to ask yourself. All right, first of all, you're starting with the Sagittarian, and I think you can sense that when you look at Louise. Sagittarians are upbeat, they're philosophical, they're fun-loving, they're anything goes. I asked her, do you want people seeing your name? Do you want people seeing this on YouTube? What is a typical Sag answer? I don't care, let it fly. Beautiful Sag answer. So you're looking for things in the chart that are going to accentuate that Sagittarianness or differ with it. So you've got very Sagittarian mind, Mercury, actions, Mars, Jupiter is Jupiter is the ruler of Sag. Jupiter's seven degrees from her sun. So she's very, very Sagittarian. She loves to read, she loves to explore, she loves to travel, doesn't even care where it is, she can't stand complications. Okay? So then what do you see that three more things come into play? that change things dramatically. First of all, Saturn is rising in the first house. And any planet that's in this area is extremely critical, very critical, because this describes your early life. And the fact that, I'd like to get her on my screen, there she is. The fact that this ascendant is a two and, and Saturn is at seven, we're almost exactly five, five degrees apart here, and that corresponds to your fifth year of life. And Saturn definitely corresponds to your father. So I would start questioning a birth time of 907. That's a pretty good time. Someone's looking at the clock. They didn't write down nine or 930. They wrote down 907 in England. I would expect by direction, by moving everything one degree per year of life, something happened with your father at age five. This may have been something that happened to him that you didn't know. It, it, it indicates that somehow through him, you face some limitation. You face that you were not going to be able to do this or that because that's how Saturn works. Now you can think about that, and if it doesn't pop up, that's an early age, let it simmer and you'll see what happens. But nevertheless, what we see here is a very good Saturn. Why? Number one, Sages need Saturn. Sages do what? They promise and they don't deliver. Why do they promise and don't deliver? Because they get excited. Oh, we're going to be moving on Saturday. Who's going to come? Oh, I'm coming, I'm coming. And then you get there and start moving, and the sad, sad says, oh, this is too much work. I'm not having enough fun, and they skip out. Well, Louise is not that way, because Louise is picking up a lot of Saturn Capricorn energy. Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn. She has Capricorn rising. So this really helps you tame down that Sag, because Sag's problem is getting over excited, over excited, volunteering and not delivering. So this really compensates and balances out that Sag. So we know you have strong Capricorn traits, and you got enough Sag in you that the Saturn or Capricorn is not going to get out of hand. So this is really pretty well blended. Now, secondly, we go to the very top of the chart. Neptune is at 18.14, the midheaven is 9.58, and remember, the top of the chart is what calls you. It's your career, it's your calling. And when Neptune is up there at the top of the chart, it's a spiritual calling. These people are called to the convent, 
they're called to uh, monasteries, they're called to study at least spiritual and religious things. It's a very strong calling, and it's going to require me to go looking at her past life chart before I can find out more what that's about. Religious callings, spiritual callings, are very much in sync with all the Sag, because Sag is a very idealistic, philosophical sign. They're usually a social sign, but it doesn't take them much to become a universal sign. So with that Neptune up there, you're really drawn towards spirit. Going back now. Okay, you can see the chart again. Okay, notice how the Neptune is one degree from Venus, less than a degree from Venus. In Scorpio, okay, Venus in Scorpio is very passionate. Venus next to Neptune is a born romantic. Sagas are not born romantics. Capricorn people are not born romantics. Moon and Gemini people are not born romantics, but Louise is because of the Venus-Neptune conjunction in the proximity to the, to the, to the midheaven here. So we know that she's very romantic, she's very spiritual, but she's not airy-fairy because she's got her feet on the ground because she's got a, such a strong Saturn. Now, above all these things, the most important planet in the chart is right here, the moon. Why is the moon so strong? And you hear, this is, this is Eris, so, so I just put it on the charts to watch, so don't pay attention to Eris right now because she's so slow moving. The moon really sticks out in this chart more than anything because this is called a bucket pattern. Here's the bucket, here's the handle. Here's the bucket, grouped together, here's the moon. So, notice she's born as the full moon is forming. Here's the sun at 21, here's the moon at 12. So we go nine, 18 hours later, 18 hours later, that moon is at 21, right opposite the sun. So she's born 18 hours before the full moon. Now, when the moon is separate like this, she becomes very lunar or Cancerian. So now we're starting to see a lot of things now. Sagas are not the warmest people in the zodiac. They're fun, they're friendly. Moon and Gemini are similar, but when your moon is accentuated, you're very Cancerian because the moon rules Cancer. And you can bet on this. This is why she's even more well balanced. Now she's got the lightheartedness of the sun and moon. She's got the moon making her a real provider and nurturer. She's got the seriousness of Capricorn. She's got the funness of all the Sag. She's got the romantic side of all the Scorpio. This is a very well balanced chart. Now, I'm not playing games with this chart because here we are and it's being singled out. This doesn't, there is no way in hell that we're looking at this chart some night out of novelty. Her chart is going through a major turning point and that's why she's been selected to be looked at tonight. It wasn't my choice. The universe picks it by itself or else it wouldn't happen. But we can now tell the main stuff in the chart. She's very Cancerian. She's very Sagittarian. Capricorn. She's very Piscean, because Neptune rules Pisces. So let's turn your microphone on, Louise, um, and hear that wonderful British accent. What do you think so far? Well, it's all spot on, really. Yeah, except the five year five with my dad. I'm trying to think what happened then. I don't remember a lot. Of okay, now the five year thing with your dad can be many things. It would be more significant if that Saturn were retrograde, but it's not. 
Now, yeah. if it's not the father, can we say next? Was your mother more of the authoritarian? Um, no, my dad was. Okay. Maybe, actually, maybe we moved about then. He might have moved us. Okay, usually what happens when Saturn gets involved is you face limitations. You, yeah. you, you're a little kid and little kids don't have any idea what restrictions are, I can do anything. All of a sudden, something happened when you were five and you ran into a brick wall and you realize you're not going to be able to get past that brick wall. This could even be something like the discovery of polio, the discovery of uh, problems with your legs, your hips especially. Do you remember anything then? No, but I do remember when I, I started school at five and I did not want to go to school ever. Did you find it restrictive? Very. <laughs> okay, well, it's very common that a Sag when the moon in Gemini is going mm. to find a lot of things restrictive. If yeah. I had more time with you personally, I would dig into that Saturn placement much mm. deeper because I think it's very significant. Mm. All right, so let's go on now. So Let's, let me show you how the harmonics get involved. Um, the chart pleases me because the chart is pretty well balanced. The only area of the chart that worries me as an experienced astrologer is the Neptune's too close here. Okay? The Neptune is 814, the mid is 948. And I don't like any planets too close to the four angles. I just don't like it because it's too suffocating. And what happens when Neptune is near the midheaven? It makes you martyristic. It makes you, I'm called to do what I want to do, but I've got to do this instead. But, I, but it, it'll be, it will be greedy. It would look greedy. It would look selfish. I can't really do what I want to do because of this argument that you're somehow being selfish. Does that make any sense? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Not so much. Not so much right now. Now I'm older, but for back no. then, yeah. Okay, so we'll yeah. keep that in mind, and I'm going to go to your past life chart, which I call the um, the spiritual transcript. I'm going to switch to it now. Somebody needs to meet their mic. That's me. Sorry, I got you. It's all right. Okay. Can you all see, can you see your 12th harmonic now with Chiron at the top? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Notice now, this is the past life chart. I'm showing you this because I want to know what is it. Let me talk to you straight away here. I'm showing the 12th harmonic. I want to know why did Louise set up her birth chart? With Neptune so strong, with Saturn right there, it's a well-balanced chart. And what I've learned by looking at these spiritual charts, these 12 harmonics, is when you look at them, and it's the number 12 because of the 12th sign of Pisces, it's a very spiritual chart. So what I find is the 12 harmonics of most of us we're not good enough. We're not holy enough. We didn't go to church enough. We had a big mouth. We didn't pray enough. We were seen. We were sp spoken, heard instead of just seen. So that's what I find commonly. And I have to do a lot of work to learn more. Because in the past life chart, we don't think about our home and our marriage and our partnership. We don't think about our jobs and our money and going to the mall. In the past life chart, we think about God, where we came from, how we can get back. Because I don't care what you think, deep inside you, that's what you're yearning for. You're yearning to go back. And when you're born with Neptune at the midheaven like you are, there's a constant yearning in you. There's almost a constant dissatisfaction. 
that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. This can become very chronic mm -hmm. because unless you identify it properly, you will be very led to misidentify it. Mm -hmm. what, when you're saying that's not it, what it means is the world doesn't hold anything for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The world doesn't hold anything for you, just like Jesus said. Okay, and many, many great spiritual leaders. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the past life, we want to see what are we seeing that's causing her to put that Neptune there? Because you decide ahead of time what your chart's going to look like before you think this life. I believe you choose the players, the people, the roles people are going to play. If you lose your arm at age 15, I believe you know exactly what moment that's going to happen before it happens. <laughs> Get into that stuff later. So let's go back to your past life chart and see what we find. Okay, do you all see time run at the top? Shaped like a key? Mm -hmm. Do you see it, Louis? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. All right. Now, in the past life chart, what do we see? These things are amazingly powerful, and you even pay attention to what sign? Eris in Cancer, Neptune in Cancer, Venus in Cancer, Mars in Cancer, everything opposite. Chiron and Capricorn, Saturn. Chiron, Capricorn, Saturn. So you have a very heavy duty, religious, spiritual, intellectual, philosophical chart, which is saying to you, don't talk unless you're supposed to talk, and don't talk unless you say it right. That's what my dad always said when I was little. And this has got nothing to do with your dad, even though yeah. your dad was playing the role, yes. Yeah. This yeah. comes from a past life. Mm -hmm. This is what tarot cards call the, the what? The Aerophant? Oh, Hierophant, yeah. Hierophant. Yeah. This is what you call dogma. This mm -hmm. is the voice of the church telling you to shut up, be quiet, don't talk. But what happened to you? Here's your Chiron of 12. What's the, uh, what's the exact opposite point? Neptune? You're really, really inundated with the sound of the organ and the Latin mass. Oh my God, is that powerful. And what does it do? It sends all of its energy to Mercury and Aries. Uh -huh. The 12th house. Well, think about that. Wow. You've got all this tremendous tension of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And it's all being sent to Mercury and Aries, which is, do it, do it, do it, say it, say it, say it, say it, say it. But it's in the 12th house. So it's like this. So you had this tremendous release of all this frustration, but it didn't get out anywhere. It got the, how come it's like this? Why do I got to go to church? I don't want to go to church. I can't be myself in church, all this. So you've got this built-in frustration. Oh, yeah. It's all at the ninth, tenth degree of Aries. Mm. Notice what we're talking about tonight. All the planets in Aries are trying to work on this 12th harmonic, and they're trying to say to you, what does this really mean? Let me show you. This is what I really want to write about. This is where my heart is. What does this really want to say? Mm. It wants to say to you, have reverence for God. Have reverence for what you've been given. But don't be an idiot. Don't start screaming louder than the preacher. But it's not supposed to say what it's been saying all these years. You bow at the feet of the preacher. Only the preacher knows right. You don't know anything. Oh, save the wretch like me. Those things got to go. Your chart is really tilted. So what we're seeing here is the release. Mm. You see, your past life has been, say it, say it, say it, say it, say it. 
You wanted to say it, but you couldn't get it out. You weren't allowed to. You couldn't say it physically. People yeah. didn't want to listen. You were too threatening. Whatever. You look up here. Here's sun next to Uranus, opposite Pluto. So you have a very powerful sense of self. You had a very powerful sense that you were on the right track, but you couldn't quite say it. Now, all these planets are in Aries right now, and they're okaying it. And this is all turning into a green light. And you're finding that what you wanted to say all the time was fine. It was good. It was life supporting. It was liberating. And the more you've sat upon it, the worse it gets. The more it comes out distorted. And we don't need sages with any help putting their feet there. No. <laughs> God, that's really, really that's strong. what's going on in your chart. Yeah. Is how do I say this? I'm I'm gonna go on a bit of a soapbox <laughs> here. We are going through a marvelous age now, even though it's scary and it's tough. We're going to the end of the age in Maya Copa. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Put me on the cross. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> The organs playing. Shh, 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 shh. There is a place for reverence. There is a place for respect yeah. it's for snow. what your preacher and your teacher is doing. Okay, but what's happening in your chart and happening? It's happening globally now. You're seeing it with the the women's movement. We want to speak up, and if you take a look. In general, what the huge women's movement did, the signs weren't nasty. The signs were speaking up. Now they're starting in 10 states and they want to start making it illegal to speak out. I know. Did you see that? About yes. 10 states have ordered uh, laws, propositions, and legislation to make it illegal to speak peacefully. Mm -hmm. That ain't going to happen. So that's what's going on in your chart. You're being released from inside. It is happening. There is no reason to go much further with your chart. That's what's happening. And what I'm telling you, this is a beautiful example. When the planets hit you, they are symbolic that you're ready to do it. Yes. So tell me how you feel. Well, I suddenly found like I've got more um, meaning and purpose in my life lately, which is fabulous. And and I kind of um, I have a coach, and I kind of, I did sort of say, look, I'm a, really I'm a spiritual teacher. But uh, but don't you feel that the real sign now is that you're ready? That you mm -hmm. oh, yeah. that yeah. the turning point is inside you are allowed to speak out now yeah yeah let's hear it for louise Yay. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to do my relocation do i shall i book a session with you for that <laughs> well i certainly i certainly can now yeah. let uh, we will get to that now everybody's yeah. saying yay with their microphones turned off so when i saw that she was from derby england and i saw that she's living in utah I did a relocation chart. And a relocation chart is if you're born in England, let's do another chart as if you were born in Utah, even though you weren't. And these call these are called relocation charts. And I got the shock of my life. Let me show you what I found. So here is here is her birth chart. With the Venus, you see it now with the Venus Neptune at the top, with the Saturn over here. This is the birth chart that will always rule her life. This is her initial stamp, her initial seed, etc. When I did the relocation for Utah, I got this. Now, so instead of the Venus Neptune being at the top, the Venus Neptune moved down to here, 
because of the different time zone she's in. Remember, astrology is not only how the planets look, it's how they look to you from the point on Earth of when which you're looking at it. If I said that right. So, what became significant, and this is the most powerful of all, is she ended up with 15, 16 degrees of Capricorn at the bottom. You would not know this unless you did the relocation chart for Sandy, Utah. Where is Pluto now? 16, 17, 18 Capricorn. So in the last two years, Pluto has been going back and forth on the nadir in the relocation chart, not in the birth chart. Now the relocation chart is true, it is real, it's not as powerful as the natal chart, but I look at both when I got somebody living far from home. What does this mean when Pluto's at the bottom of the chart? It means that since she's moved to Sandy, she's feeling now like she's outgrown the place and she needs to be repotted. She needs to be repotted. She can no longer grow where she is. I don't know why. And when you need repotted, it means you need sweeping changes. It's just like a plant. You pull the plant out of the water, that's you, and all the dirty water comes off the plant, and you clip off all the bad stems there, and you clean it up, and you wash it down, and you put the chemicals on it, and you wash it, and you get a brand new pot that's beautiful and bigger with new soil, and you repot yourself and push it out into the sun. That's symbolic of, it's all symbolic of the heart. I can't keep living there. It's dark, it's old, it's same old stuff. I can't keep living there. That's why when things like this happen, and people ask me about moving physically, I usually say to them, wonderful, yes, go move, because a physical move usually helps the emotional move, which is really what's happening. Does that make sense to you now? Yeah, it does. It does. We've actually moved, well, actually it was three years ago. We moved twice in six months. <laughs> that was the Plato. Okay, what, yes. what was the reason behind it? Uh, we moved to Texas because, well, we just thought my husband's company was going bust and I like moving anyway. And then uh, he wanted to move back here, so we moved back here. So. Okay, now why, why do you feel, do you feel repotted there or do you feel you have another move? No, I feel repotted here because we moved to a completely different area. Okay. Well, we you're feel... right on track and it's beautiful. Yeah. Very, very good. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to shift gears here because we only have so much time. Thank you, uh, Louise. Thank you. I want to show everybody why Elizabeth Warren. This is Elizabeth Warren. Can you see her chart, everybody, with Venus at the top? Okay. Why is this woman such a powerhouse? Now, remember, cancer women are not usually powerhouses. Cancers can be rather quiet and unafraid uh, or afraid of confrontation. Well, we don't see that with her. She's speaking up. She's becoming the voice. She's becoming the Pluto inside the Senate. They're even inventing certain rules to make her shut up. <laughs> I'm going to show you why she's a powerhouse, and I'm going to show you how relocation completely dominates her chart. This is Elizabeth Moore's chart. All right. Do we all see the Venus at the top? Okay. Here's the sun in Cancer. First of all, Cancer personalities are much, much stronger when the sun is up here, it's up here, it's up here. In other words, you're born around noon. When the Cancer Sun is down here, 
point, midnight, two in the morning, 10 at night, they tend, by my experience, they tend to be more withdrawn, concave, hiding under a rock. They don't want confrontation. It's a different experience. Secondly, the moon placement for a cancer is extremely critical. Our moons are our second most important planet, but to a cancer, their moon is almost like their sun sign because they're ruled by the moon. And her moon is extremely strong in the strongest place it could be, in Taurus and in the beginning of the eighth house. The eighth house is a very tough placement. Tough, strong emotions. She's got Libra rising, which gives her the ability to be tactful and polite. She's got Neptune pretty close, five degrees away, and that makes her very spiritually directed, very spiritual basis. But what makes this woman tick? Several things. Number one, a great big bucket pattern to Jupiter in Aquarius. Jupiter in Aquarius is marvelous. It means I'm going to do this weird thing called fighting for people's rights. And it's pure. And that's what it means. Wow. She doesn't belong in D.C., does she? She's pure. She's excited when she gets the group moving together. She's a danger to the status quo. So this whole Jupiter Uranus thing that's going on right now is finding its expression to her. She's got a bucket pattern to Jupiter at the strongest degree, the first degree of Aquarius. So this is one of her main impetuses. Now, if you don't know this from your reading, you should take a double glance. Cancer people can be tenacious. This is why they got the cancer with the claws. They can be tenacious. They can be very tough. And she is tough, and she's got her son half one-fourth of a degree. One-fourth of a degree from Uranus. And that means she's brilliant maybe even genius. Certainly outspoken, but she's a radical. That's the Uranus. That's the Aquarius. In the ninth house, she gets on the, the stump and she starts talking, blah, blah, blah. But you're still not seeing what you need to see, are you? Which is that battling for the underdog, battling for the people that have less, battling for the common folk. And there's your T-square to Saturn and Virgo. There's the T-square of Mars opposite Chiron, Mercury opposite Chiron, with the expression to Saturn and Virgo in the 11th, which means let's work together and let's do what's right. There's the story in the chart. The whole triangle points to Saturn and Virgo. Saturn and Virgo is very clear. Don't tell me you tried to solve this problem. Don't tell me you were trying to serve the people. You are lying. You are trying to screw the American people. Let's make you accountable. And if there's any energy in the Zodiac that's going to make you accountable, It's Virgo energy. You're not going to slip this past me. And the Saturn is why? Saturn and Virgo. So she's not afraid to talk. She's a bit of a rebel. She's going to make you accountable. She's got very strong spiritual um, inspiration. She's very drawn towards all of us winning together. All of us. But she, the thing that sticks out about her is she's here to battle for the underdog. Notice her heiress is in Aries in the sixth house. All these other Aries planets are in the sixth house. What's that mean? The sixth house is where you battle for the underdog. You fight for the underdog. So what has she done to draw the ire of the Republicans and them trying to mess with her? 
And she said, bring it on, we're just getting started. Okay, let's take a look. What's causing all this? Pluto is a fourth of a degree. Pluto is at 1816. Pluto is within one degree of Renator. Okay. They're going to try. Here's exact. This is the Nader. This is her home. This is her background, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. This is her standing. This is the base of the Statue of Liberty. They're going to try to undermine her. They're going to try to undermine her. Look what they tried already with the talk of her being American Indian. They're messing with her lineage. That's the fourth house, the bottom. So that's what they're trying to do. But what's going to happen to her is very unusual. She's not going to be knockable. They're not going to be able to mess with her because she's pure. You don't mess with the planets when you're in sync with them. She's got pure intentions. Now, if she were impure and she were trying to get money on the side and she were corrupt, she would crumble like a house of cards. But she's symbolic of that good, strong part of America that is true. And people love it when she talks, a lot of people, because she's honest and she's going after the real problem. The Saturn in Virgo is pure. The Sun Uranus, and remember, the Sun, Uranus, and Cancer is all about families, the rights of the family, the rights of families to be independent, independent, etc. But I want to show you one more thing before I move on to your questions. This is amazing. Now remember, here's your chart. Let me see what I got here. All right. She is born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Well, she's not there now, is she? Let's just assume Boston. She's a senator in Massachusetts. Let's relocate her chart for Boston, Massachusetts. So we take her birth chart. I'm sorry. This is the chart. This is the chart for Elizabeth Warren. Okay. Let's relocate her chart as if she were born, as if she were born in Boston. So I take the chart, I got the right one highlighted. I go to Relocality and I treat her as if she were born in Boston, Massachusetts. And look what we end up with. Pluto at the top of the chart. 14 degrees and 51 minutes, and the midheaven is 14 degrees and 52 minutes, within one minute in Leo. This woman is Pluto in Leo, and she's saying to the Congress, bring it on, bring it on. She's got more balls than all the men in all the Congress. She does. This is why. Pluto in Leo at the top of her chart. This woman was sent to us to play this role. Again, we see the T-squared to Saturn in Virgo. So you see the relocality chart comes into play here. Now, for those of you who are born in one state and residing in another, I, I, encourage you to have a relocality chart for the city in which you live and you will see it change dramatically. That's more advanced stuff, but I wanted to show you two important ones. We saw where Louise comes from England to be in Utah and we see Pluto's crossing the bottom of her chart. If you just used her birth chart, you would have never seen why she moved. We see Warren relocated to Boston, Pluto, that's the power area for her. So 
I can't say what will happen to her, but you can see how astrology is so versatile. I mainly spend my time almost all with the birth chart, but sometimes the read locality chart does show me a lot. So we have time for your questions now. If you would like to unmute, I'm going to stop the recording and thank my uh, viewers.